Because there is some fascinating research that's been done on that across a couple of different areas. Um, the one that I cited right near the end, and, and maybe should recite, and that is that there was um, the uh, author of the text that I was citing uh, actually did a, a survey across about a dozen studies that were done between the mid-1980s and the end of the 1990s. And what he found was that all but one of those studies, in fact, showed um, that there was a that young people tend not to suffer as many tip of the tongues as us um, uh, the older people um, in general. Um, and, and the question, it turned out the only study that didn't find that effect was one that didn't focus specifically on developmental issues anyway. So there might be some reason why we would expect that to, um, to happen. But in any case, let's look at the, uh, the data we were talking about, and that is the tip of the tongue phenomenon. The question that we end up with is trying to explain how it is the tip of the tongues would tend to become more common as we get older. And there turn out to be two general models, one of which we talked about last time. And that is that the, the, what, the decrement model is arguing that what may be happening in, in, uh, in our heads is basically that there's a gradual breakdown in the associative link between each of the words that we've packed away and know how to use in our head. And that if that's the case, if the linkages gradually become weaker, the link between word to word to word, what you would expect is an increase in the number of tip of the tongues phenomenon. And interestingly enough, what we find is that the, the studies that use diaries, um, where somebody is asked to simply keep a, a, a record with them and to report any time they do have a tip of the tongue phenomenon, how much effort they have to put into uh, actually recalling a word and so forth, then in essence what you tend to get is a very different kind of situation in those studies than you do in, in studies that involve um, putting you in a laboratory, reading to you a, a complex ex, uh, definition, as I did the other day. Um, and you get a very different kind of, of explanation in that case, and that is that the, the study using diaries reach a different conclusion than do the, the lab-based studies, arguing that, that uh, younger people are more likely to experience TOT. So there's a case where the research technique actually interferes with or alters the conclusion as to when you're most likely to find TOTs tips of the tongue phenomenon. Another explanation that has been offered, the one we didn't get to last time, is what's called an incremental knowledge model. Uh, it's another explanation. What it assumes is that basically older adults have more knowledge or words stored away in their head. Uh, and as a result of that, any one word may be at a lower level of overall accessibility, just because there are so many more words attached and only so many routes by which to get to it from concept to, uh, to word. Um, and that, that uh, it may simply be, any given word may simply be at a lower level of, of retrievability and that that could be what's causing the, um, the trouble. Um, the neuropsychological studies have the potential to reveal really a significant amount about how we actually store languages and language. And tip of the tongue is, is one of those unique events that, that all languages, speakers of language, tend to, be, tend to be subject to. But what work is now beginning to lead into in, in this decade is essentially beginning to look at at the relative preponderance of TOTs when you look at people with either anterograde or retrograde amnesia, um, those that experience various types of aphasia, uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, all of those are, are likely to yield very telling information in terms of storage and also retrieval of words. Retrieval being the problem when we have a tip of the tongue phenomenon. So then the, the question has to do with the stability and accuracy of recall as a function of age. And in essence, Rubin uh, has a very nice summary of that in, in an article that I found um, in which what he does is to look at essentially memory as a function of age, just the overall issue of, of how we're able to recall. And what he finds is that at age 50, if you ask people who are 50 years of age to recall events in their life, what you find is a very nice kind of serial position effect that is regardless of the age in the older years, um, recall at the end is very effective. That is, we can recall the last half decade very easily, no particular problem. Um, but what he finds is that, that those who are in the 70s, 50s, I mean, tend to recall best events in the early to mid 20s, that is the first half of the 20s, late teen, early 20s years. And yet those in the 70s are likely to recall best major events in the later 20s, even into the 30s. Uh, so that the, the serial position dip is still there. The later, the middle adult years tend to be just tough to recall in a variety of different ways. Both groups demonstrate best recall simply for the, the most recent um, years that, that we have 
existed. And the question then is actually why this actually happens. And there are several different possibilities that, that uh, you might suggest here. One is the idea that simply up through the teenage years and sometimes into the early 20s, depending on how far you educate yourself, a lot of what you're doing is simply learning. One of my great regrets about the introductory course that I teach all the time is that like any introductory course in any discipline, it is heavily vocabulary oriented. And there's just no way to master that other than to simply memorize the terms. And so people are always grumbling at me, we've got to have a lot of memory, this, that, and the other thing. Well, yes, but you've got to learn to get to various other higher level courses. And so it, it, some of the logic behind some of the stuff that we jam into you is not always obvious in the, in the early years. Um, Another had to do with the idea that no one recalls significant events prior to about ages two or four. I did a, an informal survey in the studio here before we started the class this morning, and all of us were agreed that the first memory is likely to have been back when we were about age five. And it's interesting to contemplate why that might be. One thing I would suggest is that we don't have the vocabulary. When we're a year old, we just don't have the vocabulary to store a recallable image of whatever's happened to us. Yeah, sensory experiences, maybe, but there's no way to verbally store the information and then have any cope of being able to retrieve it at a later time. That's probably a, a key element in, in what's involved in the fact that, that we just can't recall those early years. There is also the case, of course, and we'll be looking at this a little bit later, that the way in which we store and retrieve words goes through a major shift during elementary school. In elementary school, I'll presage what I'm going to say much later in the course, and that has to do with the fact that we store words in a serial manner up until about the middle of elementary school. And then for each word class, nouns first, then verbs, then adjectives, and finally adverbs, we shift into using a model approach. Whereas if we need, if I, for an adult, if I say to you a pronoun, you're going to give me a pronoun back. If I say to you a noun for an association, you're going to give me a noun back. In other words, you and I very seldom switch word classes. Um, and yet in, in elementary school, you give somebody a noun, they'll give you a verb. Or they may attach an, an adjective before it or something like that. And that has something to say about the way in which we store the knowledge. And it may simply be more difficult to store it because our storage system is efficient, inefficient uh, in the early years. The third, and I've kind of talked about this already, is the fact that the vocabulary develops very gradually and it certainly expands our, vocab our, our ability to store information and then retrieve it in whatever form we may need later. And finally then, I'd like to point out the, the serial position nature of the, of the recall that we have. That is essentially, regardless of our age, our detailed recall tends to be greatest markedly earlier in our life or very recently with the, the, the low point in terms of detailed recall actually being in the, uh, in the middle range. Uh, in my case, that's up in the 40s, the 50s. For you guys, uh, you may not be able to tell me exactly what the difference was between what you did in ninth grade versus 10th grade, kind of the middle of your lives for the most part. Um, but in essence, um, when you start recalling lives, whether you're in 50s or 70s, uh, there are some significant events that never change. And that is by the end of college, you're looking into A, establishing a career, and B, most likely getting married and having children. And first and second child and first wife, set, well, third, okay. They're memorable, okay? Those are events that we can keep track of. And that, that kind of uh, is maybe an, a reason for the anchor in the later 20s, early 30s, as people tend to get older. But it's an interesting process to look at, just. Uh, aging as a, as a or recall as a function of aging. So today what we're going to do now is to switch into the, the um, imagery process and, and now there's going to be a major switch in the kind of things that we're looking at. We've been looking so far mainly at storage and the implications of storage and retrieval and now what we're going to be doing is, is looking at um, some of the, the more subtle lower level cognitive processes that are going on. So we're going to review the, the, some of the strategies that are used in, in their roles in, in learning. Um, Earlier, several times, we've mentioned imagery. Today, we're going to focus on that very specifically to show you what the benefits are, what the arguments are about it, and there is a major one raging in the, in the, um, in the literature here. Uh, and what that battle has to do with is essentially imagery itself. We've defined it already, but I'll define it again for you as mental representations of visual stimuli that are not physically present. And that causes the argument, because some would argue that all of our vocabulary, all of our, that's the wrong word to use, all of our memories are stored by word. They're verbally stored and that's it. 
And some don't like uh, Alan Pavio, who originally had the audacity to come out about 25 or 30 years ago with the idea, well, gosh, maybe we restore images in two different ways. But to give you an example, one of the most popular views um, is the analog perspective. And what's represented there is exactly what you're doing if I ask you to picture a clock. Okay, if you do that, essentially the image that you have created in your head is an analog. Okay, for every part of the image that you've created, there is a cognitive equivalent in your head. We'll review additional data today to demonstrate that we can predict the reaction times when we ask you to compare features that are physically distant from each other in that image as opposed to those that are very similar or close to each other. And, and close, I'm judging, in several different ways physical size, semantic relationship, and so forth and so on. But in essence, that when you, when you um, look at reaction times as a function of the size of the leap that you have to make from one point to another in an image, it has a very interesting, very consistent relationship to um, the reaction times that we actually find relative to the distance that you've had to move across an image or even uh, between various uh, sized images. As Matlin explains, that does not argue the mental images are the same as the visual image of, of something like a clock. When you're looking at a clock, that's a different process than if you're conjuring up and remembering a clock. Nobody's arguing that there isn't a difference in that case. But you can clearly differentiate between looking at a clock, as in it's now and I can give you a time, versus thinking, if I don't turn around and look, what is the actual time on that clock? That's the difference that is involved, and that's some of the elements that are involved in, in the argument that is actually uh, aflame in, in cognitive psychology right now. Kazan and Thompson in 2000 um, wrote a, a piece about pictures in your head, essentially, and what they created was essentially a model of visual imagery, their version of what's actually going on in our head. Um, and they, they um, basically argue that both visual imagery and visual perception use similar components, as we're going to see physiologically. In fact, Coslin argues in 2006 that there's as much as a 60% overlap if I ask you just to conjure up what a clock looks like versus turning and looking at a particular clock. And in that model that he proposes, there are three different, at least, major components uh, that he talks about. One of these is what's called attention shifting. Let me give you a specific example. Image a picture of your brand new Cadillac SUV. You've been saving for it, you got it a month ago. And if you can't do that, use your own car, I don't care. But in any case, image a car that would have fancy hubcaps. Got the car in mind, got an image of that car in mind. Now tell me the following. Do the hubcaps on that car feature what you see on cars occasionally where the hubcap stays still even though the wheel is rolling or do they in fact are they attached to your car and roll with it every time you turn the wheel the hubcap turns that's an example of where we've started with a big image that is your cadillac or whatever you're driving um, and then a detail of it a very specific sub detail which of course you could answer without even imaging it but it still forces us to encourages us, I should say, to think about the detail of what's involved in that case. That's an example of what Coslin refers to as attention shifting. The general subject, the car, is still there, but the feature that you're being asked to retract, uh, uh, extract from it is different, uh, and it requires more attention to minutia in that particular case. There's another feature in that model, and that has to do with one of two aspects of, of the image that I was just suggesting to you. That Cadillac, that car image that you drew up there, um, both mental images and the actual object themselves can be perceived in terms of the physical properties of them, including things like the color, the texture, the shape of the particular object. That is, if I ask you to imagine an SUV as opposed to a convertible, you come up with a different general image of the kind of car that you're imagining in that situation. That's an example of, of encoded properties related to each of those different images. And then the third one, element that he also talks about, are spatial properties, having to do, for instance, with location, the orientation that you take. I'm going to have a fascinating demonstration for that here in a couple of days when we look at maps because there are certain assumptions that you and I make when we're drawing maps, which are essentially visual images of the, of the world that we're in. And those assumptions really alter the way in which we depict things. Okay, And so that has to do with the spatial properties. Uh, and the, the argument is that, that uh, essentially, as we're going to be trying to demonstrate for you today, that imagery and perception both activate very similar structures in the cortex. It's quite amazing.
So if we look at the other side of this major argument that I've been proposing here, it has to do not with uh, the analog perspective, but rather with um, propositional perspective. The definition here is based on the idea of a propositional code. And what we're involving there is essentially an abstract representation of, it is argued, both verbal and pictorial materials. And that's where the argument comes. Because in essence, those who espouse the propositional code as the explanation for what's going on in our head are essentially arguing that information, all incoming information, is encoded into that propositional code. So what they say is essentially that to experience an image, um, the underlying propositional code is the source from which to generate the experience of an image that I asked you to put in your head uh, a couple of minutes ago. And that is, um, whether it's verbal or visual, what I've asked you to recall, the argument is that everything is stored in terms of that code and it's reconstructed from that code. That is, that the code is at the basis, whether we're talking about a stored image or stored words. We experience images, it's argued, but we do not store them. Okay, so that propositional code is the basis on which images are stored in our head, but in fact the experience is generated out of those, Im out of those uh, codes, not out of a stored recreation of the image itself. Xenon Pilishin, got a name worse than mine, in papers that range between 1984 and 2003, argues that the storage is in terms of language and it does not equal the incoming stimulus. He's arguing that there's a separation between what comes in and what actually gets stored in terms of the, of the uh, code. Images, he argues, are essentially what he calls epiphenomenal. That's another word I'm going to define for you. So in essence, we talk about an epiphenomenon as essentially a secondary or related process or experience that occurs alongside of, or at the same time as, a primary process or experience. Of course, some would argue that what's happening here in terms of Occam's razor is that we're just moving it deeper and deeper into the system, making it just that much more difficult to find what we're looking for in these various processes. But we haven't lost touch yet. But he's arguing essentially that even images are stored in language, like propositions from which we Images when we need them. That images, I misspoke on that, let me say it again. It argues that even images are stored in language-like propositions from which we recover images when we need them, language when we need them. So he argues that storing images would require phenomenal capacity. That is, if you were to take each of the images that I could ask you to call up, each of the pots in your kitchen, the plates, the cups, the saucers, the silverware, He's arguing essentially that it would take a phenomenal amount of storage space for you and I actually to individually store each of those pictures and be able to recall them wholesale. As an example of the difficulty of what you face, imagine a word like Mississippi. Okay? Think about it. And now what I'd like you to do, I'm going to take it away. Say it backward to yourself. Spell it backwards. Can you do that? I mean, forward was easy. M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. How many of you can actually do it backwards? I-P-P-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-M. Punch the button and prove it. <laughs> Go ahead. You said you could spell it backwards. Spell Mississippi backwards. I-P-P-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-M. OK. The point that I'm making is, that, and the, what the, what the um, propositional arguers are essentially saying is that we do not have photographic memories per se. We may have people who are extraordinarily gifted at recalling particular kinds of memory. We've talked about that a little bit before. The, the night show guest who meets all the people one time and then is able to sit at the podium and, and name, say, 100 people in terms of their name, their occupation, uh, and what, what area of the country they're from. But that's unusual. And it basically has to do with over-rehearsal in a given situation or a unique kind of gifted storage system. But what that Mississippi demonstration illustrates is essentially that we do not have images stored in our head. That's what it's driving toward, is that if we did, it would be just as easy to look at. I can pick any word in, in, the, uh, in the notes I'm reading off of here, perceptual, L-A-U-T-P-E-C-R-E-P. -E 
spelled backwards. But I couldn't do that at the same speed if I were actually trying to just, out of memory, do that for you. So basically, it's argued that we don't have photographic memory. But what that does is to stress the differences between perceptual experiences and mental or stored images. They are not the same. Example, and this is a kind of a, it, it takes a second to, to weigh in and understand what this example is really trying to illustrate. But if you think about um, a given photograph of a scene or people, essentially you can reinterpret a photograph of such a scene or the people that are involved. You may suddenly see, pick out a different set of cues and realize that somebody is mad at somebody else or somebody is in love with somebody else or there's something showing in that photograph that when you begin to pick up the details it makes an obvious interpretive uh, um, reaction for you in this case. Um, but if you ever looked at, a, at a, a picture in a newspaper, it happened to me one time when I was looking at the, at the um, in the Boston Globe, they had a picture of a fire that had taken place up in New Hampshire uh, on a very cold January, February day, and the effect was quite spectacular. I mean, yes, a fire was destructive, but the water that had been used by the fire department had frozen on the branches. And in essence, what the photographer had done was get down low enough with the camera so he was looking through this beautiful abstract of, of water uh, at the, the burned house, which, which was the subject of the, of the photo essay there. And it, when I first read it, I, I don't know what I pictured in my head, but it was simply not a burned house looked at through ice. It was something very different. And that was an example of, of what, it, what is called an ambiguous picture. Uh, but it turns out, once you snap to the actual correct pronunciation, not pronunciation, interpretation of a given effect, um, you can't go back and reverse it. Interestingly, if you think about it, once you, you know, if you've ever looked at a picture where you just, and finally figure it out, you can't then go back in your head and get to the point where you can look at it and be confused as you previously were. That is, the interpretation that we put into it is, is a legitimate part of our propositional code, and we can't get past that uh, in terms of reinterpreting that, that particular picture. Um, Polishin argues that people cannot reinterpret such an ambiguous mental image. It is what it is, a phrase you've probably heard sometimes before. There is a rather amazing demonstration involving uh, flashlights. So we're going to put two, uh, two lights on the screen for you here for a minute. Imagine that I've got a blue searchlight and a yellow one, or flashlights, whatever, pointing down on a, on a white floor. And in essence, what we're going to do is simply move these together closer and closer. Now, I want to remind you of basic um, uh, physics here, and that is that if we've created these two lights, the yellow and the blue, by putting a yellow filter in front of a white light and putting a blue filter in front of a white light, theoretically, what's going to happen when these two images get together? That is, what's the overlap going to be? Remembering now that we're doing a subtractive mixture here, because the yellow light was created by putting a yellow filter in, which blocks everything but the yellow, and the blue light was created by putting a blue filter between you and the, and the filament, which blocks everything but blue light. So theoretically, when you overlap them, what are you going to find? You're going to find gray. It'll be a dimmer form of light, but it should theoretically be gray. That's not the way you and I tend to imagine it. If we think about that, we put it, we add to that our knowledge of color mixture, and we tend instead not to imagine that, but rather to imagine that. You want to try doing something in a rush. Try to get a green shape that size to fit the outside of the two circles that it's supposed to be illustrating. That was a really challenging PowerPoint image in my case uh, to try and create that. But the, the result there um, is simply illustrating again the, the, the power of that stored image inside. It tends to override what we expect is going to happen in a given situation. So one of the questions then that, that is often asked to try and begin to sort this out is, well, what's going on here? When we're processing information, are are we processing stuff in parallel or are we, are we doing it in series? Imagine, for instance, that you're looking at a drawing or, or a photo of a face. When you search for a particular feature, you've got a picture of, of your friend, okay? Does your friend have freckles? You can examine the image for that and answer the question if, if you'd never bothered to look closely enough to observe whether they do or do not have freckles, at the same time that you're examining whether they have a recent case of chickenpox or sunburn. And in essence, all of those are features that we can pull out of a photograph, uh, a color photograph, uh, directly from any other. 
you can go directly from looking at, at uh, looking for freckles to looking for for sun uh, for sunburn uh, for looking for for anything. Um, the point being that what you've got in that case is spatial images which involve parallel processing. That is, you can process several different elements of a given image at a time and go directly from one to the other. Um, consider, however, that what I've handed you is not a picture of your friend, but rather a verbal description of, it turns out, all of the elements of the, of the image that I asked you to look at a minute ago. But I've asked you again the same thing. Does your friend actually have freckles? Is she suffering from chicken pox? Has he been in the sun recently so that he's sunburned at the moment? And in fact, in that case, what you're stuck with in the, in the paragraph that I've given you to read is the absolute necessity to go through the material in a serial fashion. You start in the upper left and you simply have to read until you get to the point, no freckles obvious, uh, bad sunburn, or whatever it happens to be. But the observation of those differences essentially provides some strategies by which to isolate the two very different processes that seem to be involved in serial as opposed to um, parallel processing of these, of these images. Because in essence, if the images are stored, uh, it should allow us to do certain kinds of parallel processing which aren't otherwise possible if it's done in a serial manner. If an image is stored visually, reaction times should actually be shorter for answering questions than about information which is stored serially. And that can be demonstrated in rather interesting ways. One of the classiest experiments attempts to assess the process difference, the, the possible difference, I should say, um, in an experiment that was conducted over 35 years ago now by Nielsen and Smith. The, the stimulus that was involved is a schematic of a face or a verbal description of the same face. Okay, so in looking at parallel versus uh, serial processing, we're going to actually look at uh, a study that has of an impressive array of variables. It's amazing how many they managed to pile in here. You keep count, and I'll eventually give you the answer here. In essence, the stimulus that was involved here was either a schematic picture of a face, that is a drawn image of a face, or a verbal description of that same face. And what they're going to do in presenting different images and asking various questions is to accentuate different features of the face. So one of the variables was simply, are you given the visual image or were you given simply a written description of the, of the, of the face that was involved? Another independent variable involved facial features, of which there were five that were available in various studies, only three of them might be manipulated, and there were two that were simply held constant, so the subject simply ignored them. So the, the load on memory in terms of processing what you're looking at was either three or four or five um, in terms of what was involved. Uh, and those involved a different variety of features. For instance, one of the things that was manipulated was eyes. I'm sure you've seen pictures of people that have gorgeous doe eyes, just gigantic eyes, okay? One of my cats, people will often comment on the gorgeous eyes that that Burmese cat has. And that's, that's a cat that has very big eyes of that particular kind. Um, so the eyes are one thing that can be varied. The nose, the ears are a second thing that can be varied. I screwed up the order. I meant to do eye, ears, nose. Oh, I guess I did. Eye, ears, nose, not throat, but actual mouth. Okay, and then what other facial feature can you vary? Turns out to be eyebrows. So each of those, if you think about it, on any given face can be actively manipulated. You can represent it as very small. You can represent it as quite large. So the, the, the other major variable here had to do with the size of the features that were emphasized, either in the verbal description or in the photograph that was actually presented to you, the picture that you were actually asked to use. Now this is tough. Some of the features were small. Some of them are medium. Can you make a guess about what the other value was? <laughs> Not particularly difficult. Okay, but in fact they had three different elements and so you might in some cases have a person with a, with a huge mustache and little bitty ears or beady little eyes. So they actually had different illustrations of each of those elements uh, and they could, if you think about it, you could have a very small ear, you could have a gigantic one, I'm sure you know people that do that. Um, a very large mustache, a very narrow one, uh, and so forth. So each of those features could be independently manipulated. And so the participant actually studied a face or a visual description. And then, in fact, what they were asked to do was to wait 
here's another variable. Either two, uh, sorry, there were two variables. They were either to wait four seconds, in other words, after they had looked at the image for a very brief period of time, they were asked then to wait either four seconds or then 10 seconds before they were given a series of, of questions about the image that they had actually been looking at. Okay, and so in that case, um, what we find, this is another one that took a long time to create. We're only getting started. Okay, if you look at a comparison at the four second level, um, what you can see here is that matching is essentially a flat curve. That is, there's no difference. I'll show you that one in a minute. I, I, I'm jumbled here on what I was looking at. What's happened? That is, I've gotten to a different place in my notes. Okay. In essence, there are two things. Well, I'll show you the other part of the graph, and then you can see what I'm talking about here. Um, it turns out that if you're looking, what's, what's represented by VF in the upper part is where you look at a verbal description, and then you're asked a facial image. That is, you're given the actual face and asked to, to recall information. So the VF curves in, in green at the top are those where in the two conditions, whether waiting four or 10 seconds, you looked at either a visual image and then the face, um, not either, you looked at a visual image, uh, I'm gonna mistake it, a verbal image. You read a written, I should have put a W instead of a V, a verbal, a written image of the face. And then you look at the, the test that's applied is you look at the actual image of the face itself and ask, does it match or not? In each case, what these are are reaction times. Yes, it's a match. No, it's not. And what's plotted here are only those where the correct answer was yes. Okay, so we're dealing only with the matches, not the mismatches, which were thrown in to keep everybody honest. It is also clear uh, that if you go from face to face, that is, if you looked at an image, you delayed four or 10 seconds and then looked at another image and simply had to match it, it's clear that the adding an extra number of features uh, simply does not impact the, um, the ability to actually recall there. I noticed that the label on the bottom of the curve is wrong. It should be three, four, and five. I, made, I adapted another curve and I forgot to change. The five should be a four and the seven should be a five on the very bottom of the curve so you don't get confused. But essentially, whether you've got three, four, or five features involved there, if you only have to wait um, a very limited amount of time, you can do it very rapidly. Um, if you have to wait a greater length of time, there is an encumbrance and it's greater when you have a larger number of facial features that you have to remember, five as opposed to three. So in essence, there, there are a couple of different things that are, that are being demonstrated there. One is the, the clear superiority of face-to-face -face comparison. Because in essence, if you're only having to wait four seconds, when you look at the, at the test image, you can essentially do an, an overlap analysis in your own short-term memory, and it's very easy to plot, no, wait, the ears are different, or, or no, that's the same face. Very easy to do, and whether you're having to pick, compare three, four, or five images really doesn't matter. Uh, the reaction time is essentially the same. But the deterioration begins to occur when you have a verbal image that you then have to compare to a facial image short-term memory is a, is a more active impediment in that case, and so the reaction time is essentially doubled, at least, um, in, when, you're, when you're going from a verbal image into a facial image. And the question then is essentially, why is this actually happening? Okay, um, and in essence, what, what you're looking at there is, is the fact that the facial features uh, are not suffering from the deterioration that you and I tend to experience since there was pressure on the subjects. They were given a very limited amount of time to look at the photograph and an equally limited amount of time to look at the verbal description of the photograph. As you can appreciate, that's a lot tougher to do. You know, to read 100 words in four or five, six seconds and then try to retain details when you compare it um, at, a, at a later time. So in essence, the deterioration is greater when we jump to the, to the um, from, from verbal description to face than it is when we jump from face to face in that situation. Now let's go back and, and set up a, another kind of, of uh, examination of a study here by doing a very quick review of stuff that we've already talked about. So in essence, if we look at the imagery controversy between whether it's an analog that's stored or a propositional code of some sort that's stored, um, if we look at imagery in serial recall, I'm trying to set up a, a theory that we're going to look at in more detail here. But one of the questions that I've asked you already is, is a picture worth a thousand words? Okay, and the answer is very clearly yes. 
it's much easier to do, to recall uh, is this person near the shore or far out? Are there mountains in the distance or not? That's not the kind of thing you're likely to remember if you just heard a verbal description of a girl water skiing. So in essence, one picture is worth a thousand words. I'll remind you also of one that I don't have an illustration for because there were so many images, but Kinesio and Haber, we reviewed a study uh, in which they presented um, some 2,480, I think was the natural number of pictures. And what they found was that at, um, at a very rapid recall or presentation rate, they still were able to demonstrate subjects with 93% recall. In other words, those subjects could recall 2,380 pictures, having seen it, and then it goes away. So the, the memory was clearly visual in, or easily accessible in visual format. Coslin, Ball, and Reiser did a, um, created a map that we showed you that involved, in that case, the Central Pacific Railroad. And we showed you that, in fact, recall details are, are easier to achieve in that case if the map actually reflects relationally the distance between any given point on the line. And so what I did was to depict the actual miles on the railroad line from San Francisco to Reno. Uh, and it is much easier to remember that when you have the, the, uh, the, the proportions are actually correct. That is, on that particular gap or model line, the longest run is between Cisco and Truckee up in the upper end. Um, that has the longest miles between stations of any other in that. And it's not so easy. Every now and then you'll get a, a map to a, a party or a wedding uh, party or something like that, and the, the, the host will tell you something like, map is not proportional. There end up being a lot more people showing up late to that kind of a party because that proportionality simply makes it much more difficult to translate the image that you've been given to the reality of what you're driving in. If they show you a little bitty line and it turns out to be 30 miles in the trip, that tends to confuse people. That is, the, the lack of correspondence between the stored image and what is reality can be somewhat difficult in that kind of a situation. We can also look at uh, the value of imagery-rich uh, recall cues, which we did. And I'll remind you of the specific paired associate study that looked at the relative ability to, to learn a 12-item list and then recall it a short time later. Uh, and in fact, 24 hours later, recall was essentially perfect. Uh, if they were given a high imagery cue and the word they were trying to recall was also high imagery. On the other hand, if they had a low imagery response term to be recalled, the recall was not as great. But in both instances, the high imagery recall cue is clearly helpful. That is, both of those are significantly better than recall of anything, regardless of the imagery richness of the response, uh, when the cue itself was of low, low imagery value. I'll also remind you of, of the value of advanced organizers, and that was the, the uh, study that Roy Lackman did, where we, we read to you uh, with Hocked Gems Financium, Our Hero Bravely Defied, and so forth. When you view that or listen to it in the context of Christopher Columbus's trip, it's a lot easier to make cues like three sturdy sh sisters um, into ships and turbulent peaks and valleys into waves, which is, of course, exactly what that story was about. Um, and when they talk about the edge, it was, it was what, what was still rampant at that point was the idea that the Earth is flat. So the edge actually referred to the idea that somebody who was stupid enough to sail out of, of uh, uh, Europe at that time, headed west, was going to fall off the edge and never be seen again. Uh, and so that was some of the imagery that was hinted at there. But the words, other than the edge example that I happened to choose, were, were quite indirectly linked to what you were, what you were asked to, to recall in that case. But the cue, the advance organizer, was an aid to the nature of that that uh, recall. We also looked at, at the recall of actually concrete and abstract words. And in that case, Pavio was able to demonstrate that, that there is a significant difference in, in the ability between verbal codes as opposed to the images that such codes can actually generate. Okay, and that we are in general much more able to, to recall concrete words better than abstract words on a, on a straight up comparison. And so in essence, if we look at the dual code theory of, of Alan Pavio, he's really asserted that memory can be stored, he's arguing, in both verbal codes and also in terms of imaginal images. That is the Im imagery-based model of, of memory that he's talking about. So he asserts that a picture can be stored and remembered as a verbal code. Or it can be stored as an imaginal code which facilitates better recall because it retains so many more details of an image than a verbal encoding could. 
Okay, and so better recall of images is attributed to the richer array of information that is stored in what he calls the imaginal code, the code based on imagery rather than the words themselves. Now, there is, you're going to see it, I'll, I'll show in one case when I cite some experimental data here a little bit later, that we have in some ways very limited ability to, to directly assess the difference between information stored in a word format as opposed to information stored as an image. Because what's to prevent a subject from actually sitting there looking at words who you've told to study words, but in fact doing it in terms of images? It is a very difficult experimental situation to separate those two issues out and be able to, to cleanly demonstrate the difference between the two, other than in just fundamental recall, as we, we talked about previously, of words like truth and justice that have the same frequency level as words like apple and marshmallow, and with words that create instantly a very good image in our case. Um, but in essence, then, the, the evidence that we can look at in terms of each of these different theories, um, each of these different elements, has to do with some rather interesting studies that have, have been proposed over the years. Pavio has long advocated the difference. I mean, he's been doing this for about three and a half decades now. He's been around a long time arguing for this, and he's gradually winning the battle. It's been interesting to watch, because initially, I can remember my, I went into a verbal learning class, and they were very we'll cover this, but you really, this is not a legitimate theory. Uh, and they, they were just very standoffish about the very idea that, that, uh, th that we would actually store things as images. Um, but in essence, um, his, his initial idea was based on experiments that showed better retention for sentences and information that was coded both verbally and visually. For instance, he used a cat, uh, an image like uh, the cat chased the bird and it was better retained if you actually made a bizarre image out of it. That is the same words as you can see in the second example there. Let me see if I can, well, I won't mess up the computer. But in essence, what I had a minute ago was the cat chased the bird. That's very logical. That fits with everything we know. It turns out to be easier to remember that sentence if you recast it as the bird chased the cat. Because you're still got, you've still got the, the key elements of, of both represented there, but it's in a more bizarre image. And the evidence is clear that bizarre image in from, Information represented by bizarre images is more easily remembered than is um, that represented by rational and normal images. So indeed, we predict that the, uh, the cat chased the bird will not be remembered as well, and lo and behold, it isn't. I could not resist the next line. Santa, in 1977, had a gift, pardon me, for good research in the area. Of this is a, a clever through what's actually involved here. But what he did was to present essentially a series of geometric conditions, uh, as we're going to see here in a minute. So subjects were presented with one array of three different geometric objects in his study. Um, and so the, the kind of thing that you would study in the geometric condition was an image like this. This was the study image. And then you're going to be tested with one of several different, that is immediately following this, was one of several different test arrays that were presented. And the question that the subject was to answer, the participant in this case, was does the array contain the same elements, not necessarily in the same position, yes or no? OK? And there were two different variables that, that were altered here, giving us four total different conditions. And I'll show you each of, of the, the four different test conditions that were involved. So in this case, what we're looking at is a geometric condition. And we're showing this as the master that you're studying. This is the study image. Okay. Now we're going to test you in two different ways, as you'll see here in a minute. So the study image is still there. The test image that you might be presented is what's shown here where the, the, uh, they're identical. That is, we predict the fastest recall here because of the identity of the visual image. That is, the elements are identical, and the configuration itself is identical. One way in which the test could be varied was in the following way. That is, the elements are identical, same triangle, circle, and square. But the configuration in which they're presented is now linear rather than in the original configuration. A second possibility is, is not to present it in a linear array, but rather to change the elements. Now, in this case, we've got the elements are different, but the configuration is the same. So in fact, configuration on, as the vertical dimension here is identical in both cases here, and it's different in both cases here. Where in fact, in this case, we've got different elements, and we've also presented it in a different array. 
there's some degree of similarity, as you can see, between the, the test images. Remember, in each case, the subject studied this image and then was hit with one of these four and asked whether, in fact, it contains the same elements. Order didn't matter. It was simply whether the elements themselves were actually there. And you'll notice that the pattern, the study pattern there, even suggests a kind of a crude facial image. You and I tend to specialize now on the typewriter and using it. I could not see it the first time I, if somebody uh, sent me a note with a, with a colon and then a, a right-hand paren, which of course is a, si a smile tipped on its side, as, as we all now know. And so we, you know, if we're m sad about something, we do the, the left-hand paren. We've got the colon and the left-hand paren and so forth. If we're really angry about it, we do the colon and two left-hand parens if we're really annoyed at somebody. But in essence, that, that's a kind of creativity that's represented in this kind of a study. In essence, that the, the stimulus itself actually suggested the, a visual image which would encourage the visual uh, recall. The other kind of condition that was looked at here, oh, I forgot I was going to show you the results. What was found is that in terms of using the geometrical variations here, um, you'll notice that we've better than doubled the length of time that it took to come up with, and again, we're plotting here only those where the actual correct answer is yes um, in a given situation. But when you're matching geometric terms, uh, it seems like it's counterintuitive to, the, to what I'm leading toward in terms of the basis, of the visual basis of memory. But there turns out to be an explanation for it, as we'll see here in a minute. And to go after that, what Santa then did was a study that involved the same kind of experimental condition, but in this case, he's not using objects. He's actually using words that describe those objects and varying the positions of the words. So in this case, the verbal condition, the study for what I had just a minute ago, the exact parallel in the verbal condition, would be this, where instead of a triangle, we have the word. Instead of a circle and a square, we have the words representing them. But they are position-wise in exactly the same situation. That is a lot harder image to convert into a visual kind of re-representation of, of a face. Kind of still there, but in fact you don't tend to think of that when you look at it as, oh gee, it's a face, two eyes and a mouth, that was somewhat more encouraged by the, by the other one. But in essence, tests in this condition presented the same options as the geometrical condition, but without the visual properties that the geometric uh, shapes actually had. What was assumed here is that the participants would actually read in English order that is left to right and then bottom row. And so the recall order that was projected was expected to occur was triangle, circle, square when we're using this particular stimulus. So it was presumed that, that the subjects would go to the upper left as, as English requires in some sense, then the right, and then drop to the second row to pick up what was there. So that was the projected image. And it was predicted that since verbal memorization would have to be in a linear uh, row, um, that the linear ray would produce faster reaction time as opposed to the facial feature, or the, sorry, the, the uh, geometric features where you could actually look at the entire image, memorize the entire image at a given time. And now, in fact, the test images are this way. Okay, here is where the, the elements are identical. The configuration is identical. We can alter that by putting them in triangular form. So what they're projecting is that this recall will not be as fast as this recall simply because of the fact that if, if you're looking at, at words in, in this format, that is the two upper and then lower, it dictates that you will, it suggests that you will recall triangle, circle, square. That's the closest array, the closest approximation to that in standard English. And that was the reason that they projected that this would be the recall situation that would lead to the greatest one, greatest um, recall in this situation, the fastest recall, most accurate. Okay. In this case, the elements are different, triangle, circle, and arrow, like we had on the previous one, but the configuration is the same. And on this one, we've changed everything. That is, the elements are different, and the configuration has been shifted to linear in that case. And it turned out that the prediction was correct. Okay? That is, that in the verbal instance, we get better recall in this situation because of the fact that the language more closely approximates what you and I have much more often practiced, and that is words in a particular order, uh, which are significant to our definitions and so forth and so on. Since the words replaced the figures, the pattern did not suggest a face-like pattern. It had no visual properties at all. Tests in this condition presented the same options as the geometric condition, as I've just reviewed, but there were no associated visual properties here.
And so we're going to assume that the words were, that the, sub, the participants would read in English order. I've already said this. I didn't jump far enough down on my page. Sorry about that. But in essence, same question, are the words identical or not, yes or no? And the arrays involved the same four relations that we had earlier. What was found then, that the prediction was in fact correct. That is, that this form is, and it's just barely, it, it must have been based on a massive number of subjects, but they said in fact that this difference is in fact different, and that's a very small difference in, in uh, average reaction time in seconds in that case. Um, but in fact, this was the predicted one. In essence, that the when you were when you were when you read something in the same order as as in which as the order in which it was being uh, uh, tested, that would lead to the fastest condition. A question what? on the mic, if you're going to put a question on the air for me. What are you relating this to as as a study? What are you relating it to? I'm because you jumped in the from dual of... code theory into that that study, and I don't know if it was supposed to be going with dual code or what was it supposed to be going with. I've only heard about two-thirds of the question you asked, but I'm going to answer what I think was the question you asked, and that is that what we're trying to demonstrate here is that they, I'm going to be doing two different things which are hard to accomplish. I'm going to show you, first of all, there are situations in which verbal recall is superior. And that's essentially what's demonstrated by the, the graph that was on the, the screen a little bit ago. And that is that when the words are in the actual linear order in which they are presented, originally presented, that leads to the fastest recall. Um, even the absence of the image of the face in that situation is not as detrimental as the fact that the words have been presented in the actual linear order. And that the contrast to that is that when you use geometric shapes, um, you really foul up the memory by now putting them in linear order. Because although we can predict the order in which the, the words will be read, the order in which the shapes will be, will be remembered tends to be a visual image. This, this is in some ways arguing in favor of the dual storage theory of, of Pavio. And it's, in this case, it's, it's a design that is set up to basically mess up the visual component. And sure enough, it does that. The more you change the visual component, even though all the elements are there, the worse the recall tends to get. So that basically the, the geometric forms are in fact stored in spatial position is what's being demonstrated there. And that's more impeded when you shift the, the spatial condition, the spatial location when you're doing a linear comparison. So in essence, then I'm going to go through another series of studies here. This will get a little boring in terms of, of illustrations, but you can uh, kind of listen along here. Uh, Roland and Freiburg in 1985 asked subjects to do three different things. And now we're beginning to get into the literature where it's measuring uh, associated cognitive uh, internal physical activities at the same time. What they did in their study was to ask subjects to identify, uh, first of all, to mentally recite a word jingle. They were given a jingle which they were asked to recite over and over again. They were asked also to mentally recite, that is to practice, walking a route from their house to various points in their neighborhood. That is to image what they would see as they actually go out the front door, down the sidewalk, hang a left, go to the corner, hang another left, and what you'll see in that kind of a journey. And then thirdly, they also asked another group, a set of subjects uh, to engage in mental arithmetic. Uh, again, cognitively involved, but in this case, simply using numbers. And what they did at the same time was to measure blood flow into various parts of the brain. Okay? And what they found was that the increased activity in the visual cortex only occurred in the task involving imaging walking around the neighborhood, not in either of the mental tasks. So when you're asked to do either jingles or math, it doesn't activate the, the um, element of the, of the cortex that is otherwise involved, um, the visual cortex, I mean the occipital lobe. Um, but in fact, when you're actually asked to take a mental walk from your house to anywhere in the neighborhood, in fact, there is a greater amount of, of activity measured in the, in the occipital uh, lobe. These are the areas of the left cortex also measured in this study that were precisely involved in, in processing spoken language and scenes that are actually viewed, not imagined, but actually viewed. And the differences in activities that we saw in those two situations um, were reflective of the, the use of the same area of the occipital lobe when engaged in an obviously visual task in that situation. That is, when imagining visual and verbal events, we use the same areas of the brain as would be involved in the actual processing were those events actually unfolding in front of us. Okay? Goldenberg, in 1987, did another study. 
It was a simpler uh, imagery task that he engaged in in this case. What he did was to ask subjects to listen to and learn a list of concrete words. Nothing else, just concrete words. Try just to listen, one group was told. And another group was told, try to create a, verbal, a, a, a mental image of each of the words. So in this case, in one case, they were told simply listen to a list of concrete words. In the other case, they were told to try to create an image that's related to the, the concrete words that you have heard in that situation. And what they found was that there was more blood flow into the occipital lobe for the imagery group. That is the one that had actually demonstrated or been asked to, to, to imagine the, the an image of the word that they were talking about. And there was better recall for those words when they had been asked to image them than simply to listen to them, both of which are consistent with predictions of, uh, out of Pavio's dual coding theory. Kernios, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Whoops, I went too far here. Hang on a second, let's try and back up one. There we go. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, I did two studies here of this. I did <laughs> citing two studies here. It's the reason I'm getting ahead of myself, okay? Kunios and Holcomb in 1994, and another study that we referred to back a ways by Farah in 1988, measured event-related potentials, that is ERP, under conditions that asked subjects to do one of three things. Read a concrete word, read and form an image of concrete words, or read abstract words. Okay, so one of three things was involved there. And both of those studies in 98, uh, 88 and in 94 found significantly greater lobe when reading and imaging concrete words. Okay? But Farah did not find a large difference in the ERPs, whether instructed to read or to image concrete words. We may have a handle into cheating there. Because there's no guarantee in that situation that although you told people to just read the words or specifically read the words and image them, I'm not at all surprised that that's the one case where there's not a clean difference being demonstrated because the otherwise the apparatus was exactly identical and the instructions except in one case you're told to image the words and in the other case you're not. This is suggesting that in fact um, um, maybe there was a little hanky-panky among the participants in, in going through that. I won't charge them directly, but there is that possibility. So in any case, let's then look at, at visual versus spatial imagery. And this gets into one of my all-time favorite studies in all of psychology. And this was one by Shepard and Metzler in 1971. Okay, Shepard is actually the driving force here. He has a number of studies over, over uh, several decades after this initial uh, enlightened study. But he initiated some of the most interesting, revealing, and yet challenging work that's, that's been done in, in the last 40 years in, in cognitive psychology. What he did was to present stimuli of this kind. They were essentially two-dimensional drawings or three-dimensional figures of building block patterns. In this case, I've shown you the three-dimensional figures, okay? And what he did then, in addition to two or three-dimensional patterns, was to actually rotate them either in two or in three dimensions. I'm going to share with you here only two-dimensional rotations. It really bends your head if you try to keep track of a three-dimensional rotation, so I won't force you today. But in essence, what's involved here is the following kind of a situation. If you take that image on the left, can you rotate it? And again, keep in mind, it's two-dimensional here. So we're only talking about rotating it left or right, like on a clock face. Can you match up the figure on the left with the figure on the right? The question is, is the figure on the right a matched, a rotated image of the figure on the left? It's a match, okay? The other kind that was included here is this where there in fact is no match. And that is, it doesn't matter how you twist that figure on the left, you can't get it to match the figure on the right. They simply are not the same figure. So what he did was to pose 50% of the puzzles like the one I just gave to you, and 50% of them like this, in order to keep the subjects honest. That is, they had to process each image. And then what we're going to look at here later, um, well, in fact, I'll give you the puzzles first. What about this? <laughs> Is this a match or not? Again, it's a two-dimensional rotation. Is that a match or is it not? How about this one? 
Is that a match? Or is it not? It is not a match. Okay? If you check it out, the key difference is this block in the back. It's on one side in this diagram, it's on the other side in this diagram. Okay? So that's not a match. How about this one? That one's a little tougher, and I'll show you why here in a minute, but in essence, that is a match. Okay? The reason it's so tough is it's a 180 degree rotation that is involved in that. You've got to flip it exactly from, night, from midnight to six o'clock. And the results are stunning, okay? You couldn't ask for a better set of experimental results than he found, and that is what's plotted here, only looking at the, at the, where the correct answer was yes, it is a match. The one is a rotated version of the other. In the two-dimensional, this is what you find. If you rotate it 20 degrees, it takes about a second and a half to respond, yes, that's a match. If you rotate it a full 180 degrees, it takes twice that, three times that almost. It takes almost full four seconds. You may have sensed in your own self it took a little bit longer to do that one that I told you was actually a 180 degrees uh, twist in order to get that kind of a, a matchup in that case. That kind of positive result is the kind that keeps experimental psychologists working, I guess. I mean, that's just a magnificent set of results. Um, and there's simply a direct positive linear relationship between how far the image has to be rotated to lock it up and, and match it and the reaction time to respond correctly, yes. Whether rotating it turns out a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional figure makes no difference. It's almost identical in the ease and speed with which that can be done. Uh, and it, it, uh, the, the three-dimensional rotational times actually are just slightly faster, which is a little surprising. It may just mean that you've got more of the image to work with in that, in that particular situation. But just note here also that there is not literally an image being rotated around in our head. Okay, there's not a little man inside, a little woman inside rotating actual figures. That is not what's being argued here. Does anybody remember the name of this model? What the little human inside is called? Ah, there's a tip of the tongue for you. Homunculus. Homunculus, okay? Homunculus, four. Might have gotten it. Um, but in any case, that's just not the case. We're still talking about, about an argument about propositional codes as opposed to actual point-for-point -point representation of the storage of visual images. Whatever the actual mechanical mechanism is, mental mechanism is, it still yields reaction times that yield or act as consistently as if it were an actual physical object that you were rotating. If the model's right in front of you and you have to twist it a full 180 degrees, it takes longer than to simply 20 degrees. Okay, the data clearly indicates that when we're dealing even with mental models. Note also, however, uh, I've already talked about that. Let me jump on into then another factor, and that has to do with image scanning. I'm gonna have you take a mental journey right now. Think about the house that you're living in right now, and I'd like you to tell me how many windows are there facing the outside of that house? Start anywhere and, and tell me how many windows there are in the house that you're living in right now. I'm not in a fair comparison there because the house that I have right now is 5,000 square feet. Half as much up as down, so, but I've still got to walk around 3,500 square feet. It's not all conspicuous consumption. Uh, but I had to take a longer journey. I took it twice and I got the same answer. 24. Most people will report, let me see if I can dictate would, or, or identify what I think you're doing here. What I'm expecting you probably did is to walk outside the house. It's probably easier to do it there because you can get a clean shot all the way around. You started at some predefined point, the right front corner, the left corner, maybe you started at the front door, whatever. And you then walked one way consistently all the way around the house, looking at each of the windows as you went and simply tallying them. So that by the time you got to the end, you had what you believe is, is the correct number in that situation. What happens is that our reaction times in scanning larger images also turns out to correlate with um, the size of the image that's involved. And in essence, Brooks did the, the um, study that I'm uh, describing here, and I'm gonna get to it in a minute. I don't wanna jump ahead on my slides too far here. Uh, 
well, it's ever an adventure. Oh, I know what this specifically is. This was an interesting study um, done in your head. What they did was to show you an image like this and then take it away. Okay, I didn't do that because I needed to use this to illustrate a thing. But in essence, you're allowed to look at it for, say, four, five, six seconds, and then it fades away. And then what you're asked to do is to start at a specified point, bottom left, upper right, whatever, and walk around the edge. And what you're to report in each case as you're journeying around that F, you are to say yes or no as you reach each corner. Yes, if it's an outside corner on the top or the bottom. No, if it's what would be called an inside corner. That is, it's not on the top or bottom, and it's on the inside, okay? And so in that case, what we find is this kind of a situation. Yes at this corner, yes at the next corner, yes at the next corner, okay? And so you start from a pre-prescribed uh, prescribed point and you move in a predetermined order, label each corner. For a non-visual alternative, we've got that for you. Think of the following. A bird in the hand is not in the bush, which is pretty clear cut. The challenge in this case is going to be that what I want you to do is look at that sentence long enough to remember it, and then I'm going to take it away and ask you to do something else. I'm going to give you a sheet of paper. We've looked at this once before. I'm looking at it now for a different purpose. Um, and that is, I'm going to ask you to point at a sheet of paper, yes or no, regarding each of the words there, okay? You're, you're going to be asked a series of questions about that, about that image, okay? And in this case, what, what I'm going to ask you to do now is I'm going to take this away, and now the task is going to be, again, using the yeses and nos that we had before, you're going to indicate your answer in each case by pointing at yeses or noes on a sheet of paper as one option. Tapping your left hand means yes or your right hand means no as a second option or simply vocalizing yes or no. And so what's actually involved here is, is a total of six different conditions and rather than burden you with trying to memorize them all, I'll just show you the results and we can talk about the six different conditions that are involved here. But in essence, what's represented there is, is the, um, that you've got two different stimulus materials. In one case, you've got the actual diagram of the letter. And in the other case, you've got a sentence. Eight words or so, seven or eight words. It's not impossible to remember by any means. A bird in the hand is not in the bush, he says without looking at its notes. And then you're going to respond to the questions that are asked. In this case, with the sentence, the challenge that you were offered was, as you say that sentence to yourself, indicate yes if the, the word that you're saying is a noun, no if it's not a noun, okay? Yes if it's a noun, no if it's not a noun. So you're either saying it or you're pointing at it or you're tapping the hand, left or right, indicating what, whatever you happen to have. So in that case, you've got a total of six conditions. Two stimulus materials, words in a sentence or the visual diagram, and you've got three output channels. One is pointing at the sheet, the second is tapping, left or right, depending on whether you're trying to say yes or no, or three, speaking, simply saying yes or no. The results are as indicated here. In the diagram condition, subjects took between two and four times longer in the pointing condition as they did in any other condition. What's represented there uh, is seconds. I guess it is in the upper, upper. I forgot, wasn't sure whether I'd label it or not. But what's indicated there is seconds to get to the correct answer in that case. And by far, the most difficult situation there was where you were dealing with a, a visual image and then having to make a visual judgment about, can I point to this letter or do I have to move my hand there? You had to make a spatial judgment in that case. Scanning a sheet with Y's and N's seems to conflict with scanning the mental array in that situation. When scanning a mental image, they are scanning an image that is analogous to the perceptual, the perceptual one of the actual physical array. In other words, the, the expectation of, of the, uh, I've documented in this study in a different way. The fact that we are in fact using the same apparatus, whether you're actually looking at the apparatus or you're trying to do something mentally. Uh, with apparatus that you're trying to reach.
and that's what accounts for the the significant increase in the in the um, in the reaction time there in that particular situation visual diagram and a visual response being needed or a response that requires visual imagery um, and the result is there is great interference when you're required to scan another image as the pointing device doubles the the at least doubles the interference in that case in sometimes essentially a fourfold increase so the question then is is it a visual conflict or is it a spatial conflict? And in a separate experiment, what Brooks had subjects do was to close their eyes. Now they responded yes or no by tactually scanning a series of raised Ys and Ns. That is like the diagram we just showed you. I tried to do a shadowed version of it. Couldn't get the system to do it this morning. Okay, so the conflict was still there, though the stimuli were tactile, not visual. The conflict was still there, the point being, that the conflict is not visual, it's spatial. It's a spatial competition that you're having when you're looking at a given image and then trying to use your hand uh, in, a, in a remembered Y's are on the right, ends are on the left. Badley actually reported a test of whether the conflict in Brooks' task was spatial or visual. He went after it in a slightly different way. He had the subjects do two tasks. All the subjects proposed the, the image letter task that Brooks had suggested uh, and utilized. Uh, half of his subjects were also attending to a series of images. Listen to what the end of participants are loaded in with this experiment by the time we get done. It is just a mind-boggling array, the intent being to separate out all these processes that we're looking at. But in essence, what he did was to have subjects who did two tasks, okay? All of them performed the image letter task, as I said, of Brooks. Half of them were also invited to attend to a series of images that were flashed at one of two brightnesses. So you're looking, while well, all the time you're doing the visual image thing, you're looking at images that are either bright or they're dull. Bright or dull. There's still something that you have to pay attention to. And then you're supposed to press a key anytime a brighter image occurs. So keep in mind, you're looking at a figure, you're trying to press yes and no's, and now you're looking at a flashing image. Is it bright, is it dull, and making a, a pointing thing. We're not done yet. Okay, other subjects observed a swinging pendulum, blindfolded. And the way they did this was, was ingenious. What they had was an electrical sensor on the pendulum, which was swinging as pendulums swing. Okay, what you had to do with your eyes shut, with a blindfold on, was to keep the light of the flashlight, the image of the flashlight, on the pendulum. So in essence, you're being forced to conceptualize what is that pendulum doing? And they aided them because if you got off, the apparatus started buzzing. So you had a, vision, a verbal signal that cued you. So keep in mind now, what I've described is somebody who's thinking about the letter F, trying to respond, it's yes, no, as I get to each corner. So I'm doing that all the same time I'm trying to keep a flashlight on a swinging pendulum with my eyes shut, listening to a visual cue. I don't know, there are sick people that design some of these things. I'm the case, the, the, um, the, what's involved here is, is uh, the, the pendulum thing clearly involves a, a spatial task, not, not one that is specifically visual. Your eyes are shut. But in essence, the auditory tracking spatial task provided far greater interference because you're having to use the same apparatus up here in, in trying to keep the, in your mind, trying to keep the light on the, on the swinging pendulum. Okay, so the, the, this is yet another demonstration of the fact that the impairment in the Brooks task was spatial, not visual, per se, okay? So then let's, let's look at another kind of study that looks at uh, quantifying comparisons of visual uh, images. Moyer uh, asked subjects to make comparisons of the size of animals from memory. Which is larger as you think about it, a moose or a mouse? Not too hard, okay? Which is larger, a German shepherd or a leopard? That's a little tougher, but in fact, it still includes simply um, a given form of, of uh, comparison, mental imagery that you're using there. Also asked subjects to estimate the actual size of various animals, including the ones that they had compared. That is, now it's not a relative comparison, but an absolute judgment that's being due. Plotting reaction time for size difference judgments as a function of estimated size what she found was that the reaction time to make size differences declines as the difference in estimated size increases. The further different, the more different the two animals are, the quicker the judgment can be made. 
but the benefit declines as the animals get bigger. So that if you're comparing two huge animals, one of which is gigantically bigger than the other, uh, you don't get quite the same difference as you do if you're comparing two smaller animals where there is a significant proportional difference. The same effects are achieved when using actual perceptual judgment of differences in line length. You can replicate the same thing quite abstractly in a, in a lab. The similarity of findings suggests that making mental comparisons encounters the same difficulties as those when making comparisons of actual perceptions. Okay, I'm trying to nail down in every way I can the difference between the two. Given that I've got 48 seconds left, um, let me see if I can get at least partly into um, the, the judgment of whether images come in two sites or not. I'm not gonna, probably not going to be able to get through all of this for you, but let me give it a shot here. Basically, what Brooks's research indicated is that you and I are sensitive to spatial features of an image. The research indicates that you and I, um, this distinction, I should say, between visual and spatial images, cues and imagery, are, is, are, are important ones. And I'm going to have to simply drop it at that point, come back and pick up the pieces at the beginning of the next lecture. We're driving toward demonstrating there is a difference between visual storage and verbal.